place. Um, and, and people would have been thronged there and you would have had all the, the hugs and the excitement. This is a different kind of excitement and a different kind of virtual hugging and embrace that we can see from the enthusiasm and for good reason, um, Laura Davis. And uh, Laura Davis is someone whose work has been um, instrumental in people's lives for decades. Um, and tonight, part of tonight, and this is really a, a conversation that will focus on, on Laura and her book, but um, Laura was first probably known to the larger world along with Ellen Bass for their co-authored book in 1988, The Courage to Heal, um, a book that um, this, this book came out in 1988. And uh, some of us were around then working or got to see firsthand this book going into people's hands. And it's never stopped going into people's hands. Um, the work of talking about surviving child sexual abuse, uh, which has also been part of a series of other books that Laura and Ellen, they, they collaborated on another one called Beginning to Heal. And then Laura herself has done a number of other books um, over the decades. I'll circle back a little bit to Ellen too in this, but uh, because they both are in Santa Cruz. So there's this part where they um, see each other, know each other, but they really haven't done this kind of a thing together, a public thing. We were talking a little beforehand about when they last did, and it's been a good long while that the two have had like a public visitor conversation. So that makes this evening even more special. The book you're gonna hear about tonight, Laura's The Burning Light of Two Stars is a, a memoir that has its basis in the difficult stories she's had to tell in her life of, of uh, what happened with her mother. Um, the, the sort of long, I'm not gonna go into all this because you're really gonna hear it from Laura and Ellen, but the, the story of, of her mother's, her relationship with her mother, which first was um, dealing with the, you know, the legacy of the abuse that uh, Laura underwent at the, at the, from her grandfather and how they worked. She and her mother had a long, time to work that out. And then at, at, at her mother at aging, needing, looking after and care and becoming dependent on Laura. So this other relationship um, that, that she chronicles here that changes uh, as many of us also go, have gone through aspects of taking care of older parents. All this is done in a beautiful singular form of writing that Laura's done here. So you will get to hear her read a little bit and then she and Ellen will be um, uh, talking too. Um, Ellen has been with us on a couple of other occasions. She's um, been doing, she's um, did this early, this book with, with Laura in 1988 and then a few other nonfiction books, but she's probably become more known for her poetry. Um, most recently, uh, Copper Canyon, which is up here, uh, did this marvelous collection of indigo and people have come to her poetry uh, in similar ways, but for different reasons, then they've come to the books um, that Laura and Ellen did earlier. I mean, these are books that, these are poems people read to each other and especially on certain occasions, intimacy, love, trend, you know, life passages of one's own or, or those near and dear to you. So there, there's a beautiful knowingness um, in the, these poems uh, that come from humility, but also um, live life. Laura and Ellen both are wonderful teachers and that's also come through in their work. Um, they've done, and that's, uh, both of them have had students um, in various classes and uh, online and now and, and in person over the years, workshops and, and the like. Um, Laura, especially up and down various places in, in, in the area of Central Coast where she is and um, Ellen at Pacific University as well. So I will shortly get out of the way here. Um, Laura and Ellen will be, will be doing this for hope you will uh, continue to put, you can put comments, but then we also hope you will put questions and it will be easiest if you could do that in the Q&A portal, the little Q&A thing on the bottom of your screen. That way we can, if, to, to give Laura particular questions, um, uh, that will be easier. We'll work in the comments too, that will be in the chat, but it'll be easier if the actual questions come up there. I will read those, but I think you'll keep hearing from Ellen as well as Laura responds and then, um, at some point we'll reluctantly have to end, end all this, but we'll send everyone tonight, I think, with um, a wonderful feeling and, um, and a wonderful new book being celebrated. So on that note, thank you to all of you who are joining us and have kept joining us as, as I've been talking. And now ask you to please join in giving the best celebratory virtual attention and applause to Laura Davis with Ellen Bass. Thank you both. Thank you, Rick. And uh... <laughs> That, that's a beautiful introduction. 
It's really welcoming. I really appreciate it. And, and thanks to everybody at Elliott Bay for making this possible. And it's just so great to see uh, all your names in the chat. And oh gosh, we go back with a lot of you really, really far and in such deep ways. And um, I'm just so delighted to be here with Laura talking about her new book. And my Laura, we have a very long history. <laughs> Well, so, we, when do, do you remember exactly when we met? I, I exactly, exactly remember. I was 23 years old and I was a brand new baby dyke. And I had just moved to Santa Cruz uh, with the express purpose of coming out as a lesbian. Uh, <laughs> I had heard that Santa Cruz was a town full of women loving women. And I moved there uh, at 23. And the first day I was in town, I had a lot of dirty clothes and I went to the laundromat. And there on the laundromat bulletin board was a flyer for a writing workshop called Writing About Our Lives. And the teacher was Ellen Bass. And I attended a workshop she taught that very weekend. And I kept attending her classes for the next two years. That was a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I remember those laundromat flyers. You know, I'd go around putting them up everywhere. You were such a good writer right out of the shoot. Um, I remember that. And I remember it, actually when you when you go back to that first workshop, I can remember where you sat in the circle. Um, I could never have remembered how many years, but I, I can just see you sitting there. So that was the beginning. Um, so the new book is not focused on the courage to heal, but the story of the courage to heal does intersect with your memoir. And, um, and the memoir explores your relationship, your very complex relationship with your mother, the tensions, the estrangements, the healing, the paths that you traveled together. And, and one of those threads was, was the, the courage to heal. And I wonder if we could start off, I'd like to start off with you just reading a little bit from the book so we get to hear um, from the book itself and then we'll talk a little bit more. Is okay. that okay? Yeah, that's great. Let's so that. this is um, this is chapter 25, Genesis. And the only thing you need to know is that my mother's name is Temi, like Tammy, but with an E, Temi. Um, chapter 25, Genesis. Laura 28, Temi 57, Santa Cruz. During the terrible time when I was inundated by incest memories and mom and I were at war, I was trying to figure out what to do with my career. A year earlier, in 1983, I'd moved back to California after two years working as a reporter and talk show host for Rainbird Community Broadcasting in Ketchikan, Alaska. I was working three part-time media jobs in the Bay Area, but none was the right fit. I was uncertain about my next step, and so I threw a party. I invited a dozen people, friends and folks I'd worked with before. I cooked them a meal. But before we ate, I made a presentation complete with flip charts about the kinds of things I like to do, being on the radio, writing, interviewing people, and the kinds of things I never wanted to do, work in a corporation, wear a suit to work, obey lots of stupid, petty rules. Then I had them fill out a four page questionnaire about me, what they saw as my strengths and weaknesses, my talents, the careers they might imagine for me. I kept the participants on task. We also ate and had fun together. If nothing else, that party demonstrated my strongest talents at the time, communication, organization, initiative, and chutzpah. Mom would have been proud of me, but unfortunately we weren't speaking at the time. She knew nothing about this party. One of the people I invited to the What Should Laura Do With Her Life party was Ellen Bass. I'd participated in her writing circles when I was 23 and new to Santa Cruz. In the intervening years, we'd become friends. Ellen had just published I Never Told Anyone, Writings by Women Survivors of Child Sexual Abuse, the first book where women shared stories of having been sexually abused. I knew about the book and the impact it was having. And Ellen knew I'd been having incest memories. What I didn't know and learned at the party was that Ellen's publisher, Harper and Rowe, wanted her to write a sequel, a book about healing. When she told me that she'd said no, I asked, 
Would you consider writing it if you had me as a collaborator? Ellen knew I had the writing chops. Laura, if I was going to write it with anyone, I'd write it with you. But I know what it takes to write a book, and you don't. Ellen had a partner, a family, a young daughter, and she was leading groups and writing poems. She had no time for another book on incest. She told me no. I was young, single, and child-free, consumed in my own healing process. The idea of writing a book about healing grabbed me, so I waged a strategic campaign to convince Ellen to agree. How about if I do all the legwork for the first year and then you jump in once your obligations are over? How about if I do all the interviews? What if I do all the parts you don't want to do? I was friendly, determined, and relentless. Six weeks later, a yellow envelope arrived in the mail. The return address was from Ellen. Tearing it open, I pulled out a card with embossed pastel balloons imprinted on the front. Inside, a single word in cursive. Yes. And that's how the courage to heal, the book mom hated, the one that tore us even farther apart, was born. Oh boy, <laughs> I remember it well. <laughs> I, I, I had to admire Laura's ingenuity and her tenacity. She was so, she went about this in the smartest way anybody possibly could have. And, you know, I just, I just, uh, I had such respect for that. I thought, okay, you know, we, we could do it. We could do it. Given who she is, we could do it. And we had quite a relationship ourselves writing The Courage to Heal. Um, we spent more time with each other during those years than I spent with my wife. <laughs> it was, it, it, we, you know, we were together so much and we lived in, in different cities. I was in Santa Cruz and Laura was in San Francisco. So we had to uh, live at each other's houses while we wrote the book. So we would, we would spend, you know, three or four or five days at Laura's house. And then we'd spend a little time at our own houses separately working on what we did. And then we'd do the same thing at my house. And so, um, Laura was a force of nature with prodigious energy. And also she was <laughs> nine years younger than me and she was single and she was obsessed uh, because she was in this, not only to write a book that was gonna be helpful to other people, but to um, speak to her own need uh, to see the healing path. And I, I, I felt like a I felt like an old mule being driven by somebody who was in a hurry to get the field plowed, you know, before like it rained. And, um, you know, but I knew she was right. Um, and we had to do it and it, it needed both of us. And uh, we each brought skills to the work that were very complimentary. Yeah, I, I just want to give people a sense of how long ago this was. Um, we started writing this in 1985. Uh, we were working with floppy disks, and Ellen didn't even have a computer. She didn't believe in them. Uh, she had well, that's a typewriter. Not true. It wasn't like she had. You had an IBM Selectric, I think. With I, yeah, computer. I was intimidated. <laughs> intimidated. Okay. So, and I had a Mac 128. It was like the first Macintosh computer, and Ellen was still editing her drafts. Um, she would print them out on a piece of paper, and then she would take a pair of scissors, cut them up, and then tape the different parts together with Scotch tape. And so we would work together for the entire day. And I was usually pushing us to work, you know, 10 hours, 12 hours, something like that. And then after, at the end of the day, I would go and retype everything she had done and put it into the computer. Yeah, I, I'd go to bed and, and she would stay up half the night typing. I, I did suggest to you that you teach me how to use the computer. And you told me that it would take too long. <laughs> it was just quicker to do it yourself than to teach me. <laughs> Yeah, that wasn't that was not not very good. And then you know the um, the drafts were on the, that kind of paper, the accordion paper that comes out of the computer folded, and then you have to peel off the little circles on the sides. So it was really a long time ago. It was a long time ago, but we we had a we had a very successful working relationship. It wasn't always smooth, but it was 
it was always focused. We made a, a decision early on. We promised each other that regardless of whatever conflicts we had, no matter how irritated or annoyed we were with each other, that we were dedicated to writing the book and finishing it. Even if by the end, we didn't want to speak to each other again, we would write that book <laughs> as best as we possibly could. The book came first and that kept us really on track. Yeah, it, it, it was, um, it was an intense focus and intense amount of work. Um, and I was intensely driven and Ellen was too. We just, you know, I was even more so like she already was. And I was like, you know, on top of that. And, um, between us, we just kept going. And one thing that's kind of interesting is that I was cleaning my office recently and I found the original outline that we had written for The Courage to Heal. And it was about 50 pages or 60 pages. And it was it was printed on that kind of old dot matrix paper. And when I looked at it, I saw that the actual book was very close to the outline we had created. And I think we wrote that in two weekends um, getting together. We did, we did that before I took my break and you did all the interviews. You said, I, I, need, I need you to make the outline and then you can go for nine months and do all the things that are on your calendar and I'll do the interviews. I'll start on all the interviews. But I remember we did that. I didn't know you had that. I want to see that outline. <laughs> I really do. I'm glad you have it because I looked for it at one point and I couldn't find it. So I'm glad to know where it is. It was, it was, um, it was a very exhilarating experience and it was also a, a hard experience those years. Um, it was very profound because we were, we were immersed in so much suffering, but it was also so inspiring to see and be able to um, you know, share so much about the path of healing and how much healing was possible. And so many of the women that we talked to shared so much about their healing that it was also very hopeful. Um, and we were, we were just, I think I can speak for us both. We were just deeply gratified to be able to make this contribution. And, um, and then, um, you, you know, the book came out and it meant a lot to many people. And then it, before too long, um, we were very surprised though, really we shouldn't have been, but we were naive and we were surprised at the intensity of backlash that we faced. And, um, I think this is a good time, Laura. Would, would you read um, from your memoir, the part about that backlash? Sure. Um, this is chapter 29, Persistence. Laura 36, Temi 64, Santa Cruz. I found out I was pregnant while sitting on the cracked wooden seat of an outhouse in Utah. As I stared at the blue line on the white plastic wand, a fat brown spider dangled down the cobwebbed wall. I lowered the lid on the smelly sea of shit, flung open the door and raced down the path to our campsite. I shouted to Karen, it's blue, we're having a baby. Then I turned to Brian, who at 14 was not at all keen on knowing anything about my body. Brian, you're gonna have a little brother or sister. I had dreamed of this moment for years, then undreamed it. In the early years of remembering the incest, I was certain I was too damaged to become a mother. How could I possibly be a fit parent? If I had a baby, wouldn't I just repeat the abuse I'd suffered as a child? I felt terrified, sunk before I'd even begun. But years of therapy and Karen's steady love had brought me to this moment. It was 1992, the year that newspapers and magazines across the country were attacking the burgeoning incest survivors movement, enhancing the claims of the newly formed False Memory Syndrome Foundation. They were coming after us, Ellen Bass and me, because we were co-authors of The Courage to Heal, the book that had the most visibly inspired survivors empowerment. They pointed their sharp accusing fingers at us, insisting that we were destroying their families by implanting false memories in their vulnerable daughters. And they didn't just accuse us, they sued us. While I slogged through weeks of nausea, reading pregnancy books, obsessed with every twinge, feeling the quickening, that first amazing fish flop of new life in my belly, the attacks against us grew. 
Women on the street began smiling at me, clucking in approval for the first time in my adult life. With my visible pregnancy, I was passing as a heterosexual woman. As the word mother came to be no longer about her, but now intimately familiar to me, Ellen went on the road to defend us. As authors of The Courage to Heal, we were invited to be interviewed by every media outlet in the country, or so it seemed. The reporters always promised that, of course, they wanted to represent our side of the story. Of course, they were on the side of survivors. Of course, their article or radio show or TV episode would promote healing. They believed in us and our message. They believed the women we'd interviewed, the women we'd written for. So we said yes. Well, actually, it was Ellen who said yes, because I was pregnant and cocooning, protecting my heart and the tiny Eli seed growing inside me. I'll take care of this, Laura, Ellen promised, in a moment of generosity that I'm sure she lived to regret, though she was far too polite to ever say so. Ellen is a woman who always keeps her promises. As my belly swelled, I craved liver, a food I normally detest. Karen bought it organic twice a week, cooked it extra well done, smothered with browned onions and ultra crispy bacon, not a pucker of white fat remaining. While I happily devoured platefuls of it, Ellen got on an airplane and another airplane and flew off to appear on Donahue and Good Morning America and dozens of other shows. A driver would meet her at the airport with her name, Ellen Bass, held high on a cardboard sign, then drive her to the studio for makeup, depending on the budget, and then from there to the set. The hot lights beat down on her, Ellen in her flowered polyester dress, the men claiming to be falsely accused, an occasional angry wife, usually flanked by a so-called memory expert touting bogus theories. They all lined up against her, even the smooth moderators, the ones who'd been so welcoming in the green room. Once the cameras rolled, they attacked relentlessly, but Ellen never caved. She persisted. Sometimes she'd call me from her hotel room to report on the horrible things they'd said to her. She'd tell me how she remained steady, looking straight into the blinking red light above the camera ignoring the men and talking only to the survivors she knew were watching at home on TV. You aren't alone, she said to the blinking red light. Healing is possible, she told the women. It wasn't your fault, and I believe you. As my cravings changed from liver to skirt steak, the panel on my maternity stretched jeans expanded, and I made friends with other mothers-to-be. We met and stretched and dreamed about motherhood. I loved being pregnant. I grew my baby and stayed home. Ellen was our warrior. A group of incest survivors started a defense fund on our behalf. This was in the days before internet usage was widespread. So they put up signs in public bathrooms and laundromat bulletin boards, cafes and independent bookstores. They placed small ads in the back of the grassroots newsletters proliferating for survivors in those days, raising money to fight the lawsuits steamrolling over us. Every few days, I'd drive to the Santa Cruz post office to pick up another huge sack of mail. Sitting at my desk, I sliced open hundreds of letters. Inside were dollar bills, a single wrinkled one, a fiver, sometimes a 20, and love notes. Hang in there, you're fighting for all of us. The mail just kept coming, and so did the money, more than $70,000 in small bills, enough to cover half the fees for our attorney. Our publisher, Harper and Rowe, paid the other half. Months later, the lawsuits against us were dropped on First Amendment grounds. We had won. But the whole time those donations were rolling in, Ellen never stopped speaking into those cameras, always to the women at home, while the men did everything they could to destroy her, to destroy us, but they couldn't. We may have been on the front lines, but there was a whole wedge of angry, determined, empowered women behind us. 
I never told my mother about any of this. She had no idea it was happening. Oh God, it's amazing to hear you read that, Laura. Um, <laughs> I'm, I really am touched at your acknowledgement. Um, that's one of the qualities I love about you. you. You are never stingy with your appreciation and uh, it means a lot to me. It was really a terrible time. Um, At one point, my wife said to me, you know, these shows were so bad. At one point, she said to me, you know, is there like, you know, no place where you just won't go any lower? And I said, no, there isn't. <laughs> There's no place where I won't go any lower. <laughs> because it just felt like it really didn't matter what happened on the show. Like, like you wrote about, you know, what, what really, I knew there was somebody out there sitting in her bathrobe. Um, on her couch, trying to get going on the day. And uh, I didn't have to convince Oprah or the people that were arguing with me. I just had to talk to her, but I, I did have to steal myself. They'd sit me right next to um, one of those bogus memory experts. And um, I remember how visceral it felt to be that close. And, and I was just like, not gonna let them intimidate me. I always, it was like, um, you know, like when you get on the plane and you're next to somebody who you know is going to take that armrest and you want to like put your arm on there. Only here there was like really, there really was, you know, an, an armrest between. I remember, you know, I wore this little flowered dress that was sleeveless. So my arm was bare. And, um, you know, because I wanted to look flowery, um, <laughs> I, you know, um, and, uh, I remember sitting down next to this man and putting my arm on the armrest and thinking to myself, you know, if you want to try and shove my arm off of this armrest, you can, but I'm not, I'm not going to back down. You know, I'm going to just keep my arm right there and you can push your arm up against it if you want to. <laughs> well, I'm not budging. <laughs> But the courage to heal is just one thread in the new memoir. I, I wonder if you can let's let's kind of maybe shift and talk a little bit about what the real heart of the new book is. So the the uh, the burning light of two stars um, tells the story of the uh, embattled. It's the only way to put it. Embattled relationship with my mother, um, our determination to love each other over many decades. And this dramatic and surprising collision course we ended up on at the end of her life. Um, around the time of the courage to heal and leading up to that, my mother and I had this terrible rift and we spent the next 20 years trying to find our way back to each other. And if you'd asked me then, I would have said we had reconciled. Um, but then my mother got old and when she was 80 years old, um, she called one day to inform me um, that she was moving across the country 3,000 miles um, to live in my town for the rest of her life. Um, and suddenly, we no longer had this 3,000 mile buffer between us. Um, she was living in my town 24 hours a day, and she began losing her mind to dementia. And what happened for me is that these new circumstances, uh, we had, you know, our reconciliation had really depended on this distance between us. And suddenly, um, everything that was happening with her decline started bringing up for me the deepest wounds from our past, uh, which had never really fully been resolved. And so her decline really triggered every button I had. And yet I had made a promise to care for her for the rest of her life. And so the book tells the story of what happened next. Um, could I become the caregiver to the mother who had betrayed me in the past? Uh, was I actually capable of becoming the daughter she needed me to be. I remember, I remember how you felt about your mother when we were writing The Courage to Heal. She was really a, an overwhelming force in your life and your antagonist. I, I, you saw her mm -hmm. really as your enemy, I think. Uh, someone you had to create so many walls to protect yourself from. Um, I know there's a, a scene in your book um, that I think would be, let's, let's go to that scene so that, that you can read to us about that experience. Yeah, so that the, the bulk of this story takes place from the time my mother arrives in California 
um, at age 80 until her death. And then there's, you know, a lot of about the, the things I was reading before really is establishing why we were so estranged. Um, but this scene takes place when she's 80. Um, she's she's moved across the country and I'm going through this, the motions of being a good daughter. I'm doing all the right things, but actually my heart is still really hardened against her. And um, as the scene begins that I'm going to read an excerpt from, I've just visited her um, and she confronted me about how cold I am to her. Um, and, and this is what I wrote afterwards. And this really is the, the journey of the protagonist. My journey uh, through the memoir is, is the search to resolve this question. Three decades earlier, I had erected an impenetrable wall between us, a fortress with narrow slits so I could watch her approach. I ensured that my defenses were prepared any time she came near me. I always had an escape plan. It's true we later reconciled, and the fact that we were able to create a functional relationship was a miracle, but it wasn't an intimate miracle because I never took down my wall. Oh, I taught myself to be kind to her in a fake it till you make it sort of way, but I still held her at bay. My wall just got subtler. It wasn't permeable. It was hard and opaque, and there was no door. We only met in the antechamber, the common room where guests are received. Only my polished self was on display, my masked self, and only in the antechamber. Mom never saw my inner sanctum, and I never saw hers. I got as close as I could within the constraints I had established, but closed is closed and a closed heart is a lonely one. The price I paid to keep my mother out, at first with withdrawal, later with an armed fortress, and finally with the polite rules of detente, was love. The pure, unfettered love I longed for, the pure, unfettered love she craved. That day in her kitchen when I couldn't comfort her, I had to face it. My mother was still a stranger to me, with tentacles of need I was loath to touch. I wanted to be more than kind, to do more than merely what was right. I wanted to love my mother just once, freely and with the relief of a lost, exhausted child, beyond words and beyond all pretense. I wanted to lay my head on a place that was safe just once before it was too late. <sighs> yeah, that's beautiful. I, I think that the letters, um, I found that the letters from your mother that you included in the book, very striking. And um, before we turn to the, the q and I'd love to hear you talk just a little bit about the letters and, and read a little bit from that section. Yeah, when my mother died, um, I found in her things this cache of letters and um, it was all the letters I had ever written to her, all the letters she had ever written to me and first drafts of the letters she had composed and not sent. So the censored letters. And you know, I had kept all of the same. And when I put it together, there was this like fat, fat folder full of letters. Um, I was a writer and my mother was a really good writer also. Um, and it was it was very challenging to read those letters because what I found was that, what I learned about myself is that I had these habitual stories about my mother. This is who she is. This is what our relationship was. You know, um, We didn't speak for seven years. I, I said that for years, but then I, I found these letters and we had been corresponding that entire time. So I had to really confront uh, the way that I had hardened all her transgressions in stone and her good qualities had just like, passed through me like water. And so it really was a big confrontation with myself about these stories I had. They, they were true, but they were just part of the truth. Um, and I had created them to vindicate myself, to be the hero, um, and to, to justify uh, my own behavior, you know, and my own need to distance. Um, so 
and and one of the things I, I love about these letters, I, I, uh, I had a lot of editors ask me to take them out. And I there's not very many left. It's just a tiny little thread in the book. But I really like that they're there because it's it's the only place my mother gets to have her own genuine voice um, that is not filtered through my lens. So I'll just read you just a little bit. There's definitely truth in the stories I've told, but it's only part of the truth. Our history was never that bleak. For decades, I remembered only the nasty accusatory letters mom sent, but forgot the loving motherly advice that arrived in between. In a card sent during the height of our estrangement in May 1990, she wrote, my fantasy is that we would not have to work so hard on our relationship, that the expression of feelings could flow freely without fearing the price of saying the wrong thing. But alas, that is not where we are. There just isn't enough deep-seated trust. Our relationship as it presently exists is one of the major tragedies of my life, perhaps yours as well. How it hurts when I see a mother and daughter sharing a happy moment. After all these years, I still don't have the answer, but I hate our relationship as it is. And the sad reality is there is little chance that things can improve unless we tackle it again. One suggestion is to try to overcome the geographical distance, to structure more regular visits, to create some pleasurable history for us, to make up for 20 lost years. We share interests that we can enjoy together. We could now both afford more visits and I believe we can't afford not to. At this moment, between my tears, I want to have shed my last over you and our unending struggle. Time keeps getting shorter. I await your reply. You know, and the thing is, I had no memory of this letter from my mother or her ever risking this kind of honesty during these terrible years between us. A truth teller can only tell as much of the truth as she could face at a given time. That is such a powerful sentence. A truth teller can only tell as much of the truth as she can face at a given time. I, I think really your memoir, your whole memoir is such a deep search for more of the truth. And, and all the way through, you're such a diligent searcher. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it makes me, this is, a, I often quote the writer Vivian Gornick and, and, and I would like to refer to her now. Um, she says, in good writing, the reader is persuaded that the writer is on a voyage of discovery. Mm -hmm. And I really felt that reading your book. And, and she goes on to say this quite wonderful thing. Um, we are in the presence in each instance of a mind puzzling its way out of its own shadows, moving from unearned certainty to thoughtful reconsideration to clarified self-knowledge. And I think that is a very, very good um, succinct way to talk about what happens in your book. And well, maybe we should go to questions. We should go to que Does that sound good? Sounds great, Ellen. It's been such a pleasure. Oh, I know. To have this conversation great. with you. Uh, I, think, I think I can keep going. Um, but I, will, <laughs> I will say, because this is such a, the conversation between you two is so real. You could almost forget that story that Laura was reading about Ellen going out for the book is in the book. I mean, it was just, it was so real because it was the two of you with that, you know, that was your, in your lives. And it was the, from that earlier book, but that is in Laura's book. So um, that's a partly to keep it in, in, the, in that realm. So far, there's one question for Laura, I think, and there's some comments that came in because the uh, chat was turned off, so these are they were probably chat-like comments. But the let's see, the question for Laura uh, is: um, I think you told this is from Teresa Miller. I think you told me you had at some earlier point invited your mother to live with you, and I guess I'd like to hear if, um, when she suddenly years later took you up on it, you at the time regretted that long-off invitation because I think you meant it at the time you extended it. Do you think your heart always knew you could do this? Uh, no, I definitely didn't know I could do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll, if, when you read the book, you'll see that moment that uh, 
Teresa's talking about. Um, I, it was it was really like an unexpected, out of the blue, kind of almost offhand comment to my mother. It was not something I ever considered or thought about. Like I should invite my mother. I I I was kind of dependent, as I said, on that distance between us and. That that offhand remark I made, uh, this was like more than 10 years later that she suddenly took me up on it. And and she didn't, um, you know, every book has a, what's called an inciting incident, which is like the thing that kicks the action and the conflict going. And, and the inciting incident in this book is my mother's phone call announcing her imminent arrival. Um, and I, I, I had very mixed feelings. Man, I freaked out. I completely freaked. I just panicked. Um, I felt like my life was going to be over um, and that I, I couldn't handle it. Um, I didn't feel I had the emotional strength. I felt like my whole life was going to get disrupted. Uh, I, I, I didn't feel capable. Um, and, I, and I wasn't even sure I wanted to. Um, and, and it was really like a war inside me because part of me was like just totally panicked, but then going through the motions of being the good daughter, you know, because I am very capable of acting the right way. But inside, I was just churning with um, distress. Um, but there also was part of me that was like that that thing I read earlier about the called the wall, where there was part of me that actually was longing for the possibility that maybe we could like reconcile the rest of the way, you know, get past our polite kind of detente that we had established that enabled us to see each other. But what if I could actually allow myself to love her? Could I do that, you know, and, and could I really be present? So I think I was, there was, there was that part, there was a part of me that really wanted that. And I think that part was saying yes. Um, and then, the, you know, you just see that push pull inside of me, you know, through all the pages of this book. Um, trying to trying to determine like I think you know many people are in this position uh, where they have to deal with um, an elderly parent who betrayed them in some way and the betrayal is not always as severe um, as what my mother and I had which was quite severe it could be you know a misunderstanding that just it just keeps growing and festering you know and gets papered over and um, creates this obstacle that makes it very difficult when that that parent gets old and needs you and then what do you do? So, you know, I, I think this is a pretty common circumstance that people find themselves in. And it, it complicates being a caregiver, which already is a very challenging thing. Good. Next question probably takes a, has less of an extended answer. How old was your mother <laughs> when she passed? Uh, 86. Okay. And this is a question, did Ellen, did you meet? Laura's mother. I think I met your mother. <laughs> she must have hated you. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was never. But I, you know, I don't really have a very clear memory. Right. But I, I know that I did. Um, you know, because I know what she looks like, and you know how she talked. But I don't think we ever really had a conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure she's not that fond of me. Yeah, you were definitely one of the the enemies. I'm sure yeah. you were one of her antagonists for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is a question, for, I guess, for both of you: is is there still pushback from the courage to heal? Like, mm -hmm. back, and yeah, what, what forms does it take? Yeah. Well, if you go on Wikipedia, which I do not recommend, um, <laughs> the the uh, false memory syndrome people have uh, hijacked hijacked it and yeah. we at, we actually had a couple of wonderful volunteers try to take it back and and make a more um balanced even uh listing you know uh, under the courage to heal but they have people who are are just on it every single day uh to make sure that it just is a, a kind of appalling you know just trashes us and trashes the book and says how horrible everything, you know, so they're, they're still there. And once in a while, I wish people wouldn't do this, but once in a while, somebody will say, did you see this? And they'll send me some link to some terrible thing. And of course, you know, I wind up reading it, but um, don't, don't send me any terrible links. <laughs> I, you know, I think the other thing I wanna say is that, you know, we're talking about the backlash against us, but anytime there's any kind of forward movement um, you know, against sexual violence, you know, or against racism or against, 
you know, any of the isms and, and people begin to become empowered, there is always a backlash. I mean, we are in the hugest backlash of all in our country right now. So, you know, what happened to us is, it's kind of like in good company of a long line of yeah. people who spoke out and then got slammed for it, but also were supported for it. I think that's the really important thing that I take away is that, that, oh, yeah. that feeling of that support that was behind us. We had so much more, I mean, this, the support was wonderful. And, you know, even though Laura talks about me going out there, she talks about that wedge, you know, that I always pictured that, you know, I might've been the duck that was flying uh, in the front, but I had, you know, all these ducks flying behind me and I never felt alone. I never felt like, oh, I'm alone and I'm misunderstood. I mean, we, we had more support than anyone could imagine having. And I, I think, um, you know, Laura is is so uh, does take such marvelous initiative. And as soon as we started to get slammed with lawsuits, the first thing that she said is, "We need a, a committee. We need a support committee." And and um, and women um, just jumped right in and worked so hard on our behalf that we never felt alone. And, and I really was only nervous. I would say I really was only nervous the first two weeks. And after that, we just had so much support. Uh, Laura, this question is from Andy, um, who asks, what were your considerations as you decided how much to reveal, expose, about your mother in the book? Were there conflicts between you felt you owed to yourself, to your readers, to your mother, other relatives and and where where in there was the truth i mean what where for you well you know that's a really complicated and good question um i really didn't think i could publish this book it took me 10 years to write this memoir um and i actually had many walks with ellen uh at the ocean discussing the book you know um on a regular basis and i just had to tell myself that i didn't have to publish it and that I just had to write this story for myself because it was just like burning to come out. Um, and I, but if I thought about publishing it, I would completely shut down and stop writing and just would be terrified. And you know, one of the things that was so challenging for me is that after The Courage to Heal was published, I lost many members of my mother's side of the family and became estranged from them. And then it took decades um, to repair those relationships, you know, to make them into cordial relationships again. And I really, and, and I, all these relatives, I mean, many have died off, but the ones who are my generation, we're all getting older and there's not time to go through that again. And I, I really was afraid of having to go through that all over again. It was so painful the first time. Um, and also, you know, I, I think when I wrote The Courage to Heal with Ellen, I think my attitude about my relatives and my mother and all of them was like, you know, screw you. I'm telling the truth and you're in denial. And I, I didn't really, I was maybe scared of how they would react, but I felt very justified in publishing that book. Um, but now it's almost 35 years later, I'm in a really different phase of my life. And I, I care about the people in my extended family who may be upset by this book. Um, you know, who will find it difficult to read or will feel like I revealed too much or, you know, I'm bringing up this, the incest again, which I haven't talked about publicly in over 20 years. So, you know, it, it was a hard choice. And yet the knowing how many people would benefit by reading this story, um, it just won out. And also I am an author, you know, and I haven't, there's a reason I haven't published a book in 19 years. And this is one of the reasons was, um, that the stories I wanted to tell, I felt I was not allowed to tell. And finally, I just had to say yes. I had to say yes. And it wasn't until I really finished the book that I finally decided, yes, I am going to publish this. And um, and in terms of, you know, what I said about my mother, I don't think, I, I don't know that I would have published it before she died. Um, even though she had dementia, she would not have been very aware of what I was doing. But I um, I felt like she died and her whole generation has died out. So I, I couldn't wait for the next generation to die out because that would be me as well. Uh, so yeah, I think it's I think it's a very challenging thing, and and that I, I think it's hard having a writer in the family. It's hard having a memoirist in the family, and I'm choosing to be public, and the people I write about are not. Um, and you know, the people in the book, the you know, my spouse, my three children, uh, my brother, 
all, you know, gave permission and were enthusiastic cheerleaders and, you know, read drafts and made suggestions and corrected things I didn't remember properly and um, asked for some small changes, which I happily made. Um, so, you know, it, it's, I, but it's a challenge. And I, I, I don't feel um, just justified, like, if, you know, like, oh, well, they didn't want me to write about them, they shouldn't have done it. I, I feel it's more complicated than that for me now. Yeah. And actually, you're mentioning your children because there's part of the equation too is your mother generation, as you say, is passing, but there's going to be new children born in, you know, coming along. And it's part for them to know what's happened in the family. Um, there's, I'm going to combine a few questions here because they're, they're, all, they're all touching. And you actually started to touch on this a little bit. Um, Jan is asking, and then there's another question that came over from the um, from the from Facebook um, about life since the courage to heal and and living life since. Um, obviously, some of that's been with your mother um, as part of it because that's what the new book is. But Janet's particular question in in that larger with the larger kind of framing is how have you changed, and what's the gift been for you um, coming you know over time between. Um, the Curse to Heal, I guess, and then and then this book. You know, this book feels like coming full circle. You know, that this book is really like the prequel uh, and the sequel to The Courage to Heal. You know, it 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 the Courage to Heal is really just like the backstory to this story, which is really a mother daughter story. Um, and I think you know, I have been a passionate student and practitioner of healing my whole life, uh, my whole adult life, and so you know, I'm interested in when you have trauma in your childhood, um, what does healing look like? Not just immediately, what does it look like 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, 40 years later? And I think some of the much more complex and nuanced issues that I raise in this book are about the very, very, very long-term questions that come up as we continue to grow and evolve um, as people um, and people who have some kind of damage. And I, I feel like for me, the trauma that I experienced has given me both strengths and certain vulnerabilities. You know, I expect to carry those vulnerabilities for the rest of my life. Um, but, you know, the, my healing has continued. And, and a lot of the healing I had to do was in those years of caregiving my mother. Mm. Uh, she, was, she was really the, um, the impetus for me to push myself to really crack open a heart that had been closed. Um, there's a, there's a lot of questions now that <laughs> we won't get to, I'm sorry, we won't get to all of them, but, um, but we'll do keep going here. Um, there's a question here about whether your mother was able, ever able to admit to you that, that you'd been hurt and that she'd failed to protect you. Oh, uh, you'll have to read the book to find out. There we go. There we go. <laughs> um, That's, I want you to be asking that question the whole time you're reading. So I'm not gonna away. <laughs> well done. Well done. Uh, <sighs> that is, that is there. Um, because some of these other questions are probably coming in that point about where you are with forgiveness um, and and such. Um, let me, let's see. Uh, uh, I'm not knowing, we haven't talked about how old your children, have they read the book? And if they have, how do they react to this? Yeah, my, my children are um, 24, 28, and 44. They, they have all read the book um, and super enthusiastic. Uh, my oldest son is a, a film director and so he really he critiqued it with a vid, with a lens of a storyteller's lens. His feedback was great, and the two younger ones had just both read it at least twice and were gave me amazing feedback. And both were like, "Oh my God, Mom! I had no idea this happened." You know, there was some of that, and then there was also like, "You got this wrong, and this is how it happened." And their memories are way better than mine. So they were just incredibly supportive. I felt like they were cheering me on and. Uh, I couldn't have asked for more support from my family. And by extension, there have been a few questions about your wife too, and her her present <laughs> support uh, through the whole process for you. I mean, both you with, with the writing, but also you, just your own healing and um, going through all, and, and with your mother, everything. Yeah, I mean, I, I Karen has been like a, a complete rock and a solid person for me for over 30 years. And she was a huge um, part of, the experience of those last years with my mother because she really advocated for my mother. She loved her and she she really confronted me often about how hard I was on her and how rigid. Um, and, you know, I think she it, she helped me. 
she really helped me open and mm -hmm. and she also showed up when i was out of town when i was gone i mean she she was a fantastic daughter-in-law uh she never shirked and she she just was there all the way through the whole experience i yeah. i feel very very grateful to her wonderful um good uh ninke asks um there's a question do you have and maybe this could also be probably for ellen too do you have any recommendations for writers working on memoirs about traumatic subjects in terms of the writing process what helped you get your story out? What helped you stay in the flow and not stop? What did you do when you got triggered during the writing process? Um, I'll, I'll say a few things and maybe Ellen, you wanna chime in afterwards. I um, I had to get back into therapy to write this book. Uh, it, it just, I started getting into some material that was just really difficult and I was struggling. So, and also uh, when my mother was going through the last years of her life, I needed help differentiating the past of our relationship and the present and and those things were getting blurred together and it was not good um so that and you know i've always been in a writer's group so needing the support of other writers in a safe place to um, share my work um, and i think in terms of the the trauma it's like if you're writing about traumatic things you really need support and you need both inner and outer resources um, and you know it may be that you you write in small doses or you go to a writing retreat or you you create protection around yourself to make it a sacred space and also that when you know you're going to write a really tough scene that afterwards you have time to walk or to do whatever grounds you um, to get back in your body um, and that you and that you you have a place to share that work um, so that you're not just sitting alone with it and that there are times that it's it's not the right time to do this kind of writing. I mean, I, I wouldn't have said that decades ago, but I think sometimes you really have to look and if, if you're being triggered to the point that you're not functioning in your life, then maybe it's time to back off for a little while and maybe work on the story in a different way or not work on those parts or just walk away entirely. You know, I, I walked away from this book multiple times um, and the, each time I did, I came back with a fresh perspective. Ellen, do you want to add anything to that? I think you covered it beautifully. <laughs> So many of these comments are wrapped up in all expressions of gratitude and love to you, Laura, to both of you for you know, the courage to heal and for the, the work. This question kind of goes back to almost to the early days a little bit, but except, um, and we won't, you, you, we talked about this before we started this because there, there's a song in the book, but Laura, can you speak to the role of poetry like you took Ellen's classes and how, how was, what part has poetry played in in your journey as a writer as a reader and and coming to terms with things as poetry is sometimes a very um controlled way of addressing a lot of these things you know i'm not a poet um and I, you know i ellen has been you know the most phenomenal poet and poetry teacher um and i i don't really feel like i could address that i mean i i like to read poetry and i like poetic language um and i i worked on this manuscript for a long time um, so that it's it's a beautiful read it's not just a story um i don't know um ellen maybe I, i'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how your relationship with poetry has changed since the time of the courage to heal well i was um i, I, I just to clarify when when laura was uh in my classes they weren't only poet right. for poets Mm -hmm. that that she was not she was writing uh at that point she was writing um personal essay uh memoir kind of writing you know she was writing from her life it, they were called writing about our lives and she was writing about her life and there were women and men uh in some of the classes who were uh writing poetry but it was it was mixed and we didn't make a a really strong uh boundary between genres and I was writing poetry and I I stopped writing poetry in order to write the courage to heal um, and I stayed away from poetry for a long time and then I um, then I just missed it too much and you know poetry was my first love so after after the courage to heal uh, and after Year, some of some years working in that field, I guess about a dozen, 12, 14 years really in, in that neighborhood. Then I returned to uh, 
poetry. And, and then I returned, when I returned to teaching, I returned uh, to teaching poetry as well. Um, this question, because the two of you haven't, don't do this very often, I think we figured it's been at least um, 16 or 17 years since you did a program together. And it was, I believe in Ireland, you were, you were putting together. Uh, this is a question just for you about your family's reaction to, to the Courage to Heal. Well, um, I was not sexually abused, and so it did not really affect my family uh, very much. But you were out there on this issue. Right. No, my family wasn't really involved. And uh, uh, it, it, I mean, my, my family of origin wasn't involved at all. I mean, it, fe it affected my current family because I was never available to them <laughs> so, because I was just working so much but um there's, there's nothing really all that new about that no so I didn't have the same kinds of um personal you know I, I and I think that that worked actually very well for for Laura and me writing the book mm -hmm. that we weren't both um so personally um immersed and we could have Laura's perspective and experience as somebody who was in the thick of the healing process as we were writing The Courage to Heal and we could have my perspective. Uh, I was working with survivors of child sexual abuse during those years. So we had we had two perspectives. And I think that uh, that I think I think that actually all the differences that Laura and I have really contributed to making the book as strong as it was. I mean, it sometimes meant that we had to uh, wrestle things out. But uh, I think that if if Laura wrote the book herself or if I wrote the book myself, <laughs> uh, it would not have been as strong a book. I mean, even if we could have done double the work uh, because those um, those that combination made, made uh, I think, the book more balanced and stronger all the way along. I'm, I, I think we may be about to wind down. Let me read this one comment because there's not a question in it, but it's a tribute to both of you and it's anticipa anticipation about the new book. And to everyone who's watching this, please do put more comments in the chat or either either one as we end because um, it'll be saved and we'll, it'll get sent. So I don't think either Laura or Ellen in the midst of doing the conversation, I've had a chance to look, but I'm sure they would like to see, because um, it's it's extraordinary, the gratitude and appreciation and love, and and really, we're talking about lives being saved. Um, this comment from a Debbie says, what a wonderful conversation. Thank you both for continuing to share your truth. The courage to heal and gain to work with Ellen, I guess she knows you, uh, changed my life. I remember watching Ellen on Donahue and Oprah, those shows, and hearing Ellen's message loud and clear. I learned my truth mm -hmm. and did not feel alone for the first time in my life. The excerpts you read were powerfully moving, Laura, and I can't wait to read the book. I just lost my mother this summer. She was 99. I found a way to share my love with her despite her betrayal and despite periods of estrangement. XOXO to you both. <laughs> oh. I, I also want to just tell people that we're going to send um, a letter out to everyone who was here tonight and also those who couldn't make it. Um, and there's been some, I see some questions in the chat wanting to know more about our teaching and things like that. And we'll uh, we'll send you some links and things tomorrow, uh, as well as a um, link to the recording. So you yeah, can... that'll be that'll be great to be able to be in touch with you. And and if you want to stay in touch with us, you can opt in to our mailing list. But um, one of the things that I just want to mention before we ended was that I've been giving. Um, well, Laura, Laura, you're a great advertisement for me. I, I've been giving, <laughs> I've been giving craft talks uh, online since the pandemic started, and they're they're not just for poets, although they're focused a lot on poetry, but they're for prose writers too. And uh, um, I, I'll, I'll let you know about those, and I, and I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, that I'd love to have some of you join me if you want. I know some of you are actually already in them. So uh, already taking part. We did a program, Ellen was with a conversation with, an, uh, I can't remember who the poet was a few months ago. And it was full of people who've taken Ellen's classes and giving testimonials um, to her. And they, we're talking everything from beginning poets to establish, you know, serious poets who just feel like she's the one, you know, 
to teach and know. She's no the bomb. Teacher. Yes, yes, there we go. That's the word. Um, I think um, if we were all in the same room, this would be the point where the conversation would really keep going in, in an in-person way. And um, uh, Laura would be signing books for a long time and hearing stories from people uh, because as many as, yes, that's, you remember how that goes. Uh, as many as that's, that's really sad, actually. <laughs> I know, well, we do, you're not that far away. When we get things open back up, come up and we'll, we're, we'll you would be lovely to do something when we can do this in person. And, um, and we, do, you know, we, we did have some signed copies. We, those kind of went to, already went out. We've had quite the response to your book and tonight. Um, and I think people are gonna be so, um, pleased when they do and and then rewarded by the book itself so um I, can i just i just want to say one more thing because sure. i think it's better coming from the author than the bookseller but um if you plan to buy my book and you haven't yet please buy it from elliott bay books because independent stores really really need our support um and and they're the ones who put on this event that you've loved so please support them with your dollars um, even if you already bought a book buy one for someone else but independent stores need our need our buying power and our purchases that's how they stay alive thank thank you laura that's appreciated and and i this your book is one that will people get their copy read it and say i know others who should have this so that's also um something that's been true of both of you the books by both of you and and continues um so all all to all to um uh, be doing as part of our daily thing of putting books, books in people's hands or sending them out um, through online orders or any of those ways. Um, yes, and any last words, both of you, either one. Either I one just of... want to say that um, if you enjoyed my reading, I, I recorded the audio book. Um, and if you'd like to hear the book, um, you can get it from Libro FM. And that's a, it's an alternative to Audible. It's a way to also support independent stores and get your um, audio books. So there is an audio book out, an ebook, and the, the paperback. And and Laura sings in the, in the audio. So <laughs> we were talking about whether or not that would that just, wasn't part of tonight, but just just that's also to look forward to. Um, it's in the book too. Though. So um, thank you all so much uh, for being with us, and um, take care, everyone. Thank you for the the history every people have brought to tonight, because really, uh, what. Laura and Ellen have done has been um, such a part of people's lives, but also the whole culture, the language um, that we have learned to talk and speak and acknowledge others in. So um, um, thank you both uh, for this night and for the long, the long haul of it all. So uh, take care. Thank you. Good to be with you all. Take care. Thank you for coming. Thanks for my first thank you lunch all. party. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> Raise the glass, the cups, uh, whatever is appropriate. Yes. <laughs> Celebrate. <laughs> Right. Got it. There you go. <laughs>